Hello everyone. All right, so if you're watching this video, it means that you hopefully want to know when to use each of our quadratic methods for solving. So you should have this worksheet out or even just, you know, a piece of paper if you're, you know, taking these notes separately. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through each one of these sections. So we're going to talk about when you'd want to solve by square roots, when you'd want to use factoring, graphing, etc. Okay, and then you're going to have a second worksheet that's going to practice all these different types. Now, if you're maybe re-watching this video, you can kind of skip around. The other thing I would say is just make sure that, you know, as I go through the explanation for each method, that you pause and take time to, you know, look at what I'm saying is the key part for when you're going to use something or, you know, you think about does that make sense the when to use it if not maybe write it in your own words or uh, think about asking why that's when we would use that method okay a couple of other things so like I said we're gonna take a look at all of these methods and we're gonna look at when it's best to use each one and then these problems that you're gonna do afterwards eight problems are going to be a mix, okay? And so that's often the hardest part is you're just given a problem and you're said sol told to solve and you don't know which method to use. So you need these tools to help you figure that out. All right, so first off, when to use square roots. The main thing you want to look for is if you only have the x squared term. Okay, so that basically means you've got x squared or you've got some quantity in parentheses squared. If you're the kind of person that understands, you know, the a, b, c, so like your ax squared plus bx plus c, basically what this means is that you have no bx term. You don't have that term in the middle. Okay, so... I'm going to solve both of these for you. You don't have to do both of them, but I'm going to solve both of these for you because these are the two examples for when you would solve with square roots. Notice in both examples, we've got x squared, and then we've got something squared. Okay, that's when you would solve by square roots. Those are the only places where x shows up. In both cases, you want to get the x squared alone. So in this first one, I'm going to subtract 14. <clears throat> and so I'm going to have 2 thirds x squared equals 6. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal of this fraction. So I'm going to multiply by 3 over 2 to get rid of the 2 thirds. And then 6 times 3 is 18. So this is 18 divided by 2, so that's 9. And then I'm going to take the square root of both of them. So I'm going to get both sides. So I'm going to get going to get x equals plus or minus 3, okay? Uh, and remember, you know, when you take the square root, you get two solutions. So I got x squared by itself, I took the square root, and then I got my two solutions from the square root of 9. Over here in this second problem, same sort of thing. I'm going to add 18, so I'll have 7x minus 4 squared equals 28. And then, just like with the two-thirds, I'm going to get rid of this 7 that's out front. I'm going to divide by 7. And then x minus 4 squared equals 4. I have something squared, so I'm going to take the square root. I have x minus 4 equals positive and negative 2. So when I add my 4, I have x equals 4 plus or minus 2. That means there's two answers. You get and in this case, you can actually add these numbers together. 4 plus 2 would get you 6. 4 minus 2 would get you 2. Uh, if you don't have room to write these, you know, you can write these answers, you know, kind of like right up here. Um, there you go. Sorry. Okay. So x equals 6 and 2. Again, if you need to pause the video as I do each step, please don't hesitate to do that. All right. <clears throat> when should you use factoring? Well, typically, easiest is when you have all three terms. 
So we've got ax squared plus bx plus c, and a is 1. All right? So if I move this over, I get, oh, and just as a side note, whenever you factor, you need to be set equal to 0. That's a rule for factoring. So we can't factor right now because we equal negative 12. But if I add the 12 to the left side, then I can factor. And remember, another rule of factoring is that you want to multiply to C and you want to add to B. Okay? So what multiplies to 12 and adds to negative 6, or sorry, negative 8? 12 would be negative 6 and negative 2. x minus 6, x minus 2. I set each of these factors equal to 0. And then I solve them. So I get x equals 6 and x equals 2. I'm going to pause this and then do the problem on the right-hand side, and then you can come back and check your work. All right. Uh, the other one I also had to solve. Uh, I said equal to 0 before I could solve by factoring. And then once I factored it, I got these two numbers, 9 and negative 5. Uh, if you need more explanation on that, please do not hesitate to ask. All right. Third step, when you're graphing. So here's the deal. Graphing, it, it kind of depends on when you might want to use it. I would say if it's already y equals, so if everything's all on one side, or to check your work. Using graphing can be a really good way to do that. So here's what you want to do. You want to take this entire thing and you want to plug into y1, or if you don't have your graphing calculator, you could go to Desmos. So give me one second so I can show you this on the calculator. All right, everybody. So here's where we're at. We want to substitute negative 4x squared plus 4x plus 15 into our calculators. So I've taken the liberty of already typing this into y1. Just as a reminder, if you're in the main screen and you press this button in the upper left-hand corner, y equals, that'll get you to wherever... Um, the, the menu for writing in any, for whatever equation you need to write in. Now, if I hit the graph button, we're going to see if this will show me where my y, my x-intercepts are. So if you look, if you can follow my cursor, it looks like I probably have a y-intercept, or sorry, an x-intercept, my goodness, an x-intercept between negative 1 and negative 2, so possibly at negative, so maybe at negative 1.5. I'm putting a little approximate symbol. And then maybe at 1, 2, at 2, maybe at 2.5. So maybe approximately at 2.5. Now, here's how you can check to make sure that you're right. If you hit second, calculate, and then you go to 0 because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a 0. I'm going to move my cursor to the right until I see it come around my x-intercept. So this cursor right now, I think it's at 2.5. So what I did was I picked a left bound a little bit less than 2. And actually, just to make it easy for you, or 2 and a half. So I picked, you know, something right around 2. So my cursor is left. And then I'm going to arrow to the right until the number says that I'm bigger than 2. So 2.7 uh, is bigger than 2.5, which was what I guessed. So then I'm going to guess, which it doesn't really matter because it's going to tell me the right answer. And look at that. That's at 2.5. And then you can do the same thing. For the other value, so I'm going to go left of it, and then my cursor, I'm going to make it jump a little bit farther to the right, and then it looks like it's at negative 1.5. Okay, so especially because these are graphing examples, I'm going to write these as ordered pairs, okay? So 2.5 comma 0 and negative 1.5 comma 0. All right, we've got two methods left to go. Completing the square is next. Okay, when are you going to use completing the square? Now, side note, I just want to point out that the key thing to using completing the square is remembering that b divided by 2 squared is how you get your c value. And I would also like to point out that completing the square is best for finding the vertex. Forgetting 
the vertex. But if you do want to use it to solve, here's when you would use it. You want the A value to be 1, and you want the B value to be even. So just as a reminder, AX squared plus BX plus C. You want this number to be an even number, and you want the first number to be 1. Okay? So we've got a negative 8 in the middle that's even. X squared in the front is just has a 1 in front. All right. So I'm going to cruise through these steps. First step is you're going to move your C value over. So negative 18 is going to be on the left side. And then we're going to have X squared minus 8X. Now, I actually think you should rethink this a moment. And you should leave a blank on that left-hand side. Because you know, hopefully, if you're picking this method, that you're going to add a number to both sides. And that number comes from the negative 8. Negative 8 divided by 2, that's negative 4. And that number squared is 16. So we're going to add 16 to both sides. So on the left-hand side, that means I have negative 2. And on the right-hand side, I have x squared minus 8x plus 16. All right. After that, it's time to factor. So I am supposed to complete this so that it's a perfect square. The only way for that to happen is if this is the exact same factor. So it must be x minus 4. Just as a reminder, that number inside the factor always be divided by 2, or you could think about it as the square root of 16, which is 4. Okay, last two steps. We need to take the square root of both sides. So that's going to give us plus or minus because we took the square root. It's a negative number, so that's i. And then we can't reduce the square root of 2, so that's just going to be root 2. And that's going to equal x minus 4. And then we should add 4 to both sides so that x is all by itself. So then our final answer would be that x equals 4 plus or minus i root 2. Uh, if you ran out of space, you might want to make like two columns of work here, okay? All right, last and final method. Quadratic formula. First off, if you don't have this memorized, that's okay, but it's x equals the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. I'm going to pick a different color um, just so that this shows up because I don't have quite enough space. So 4a, sorry folks, 4ac. It's in your notes earlier, also, from earlier this week. Opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2 times a. When do you use it? When you don't know what else to use, really. When all else fails. Also, think about it this way. If a, b, and c are uh, messy. You know, maybe they're large numbers or they're composite numbers or, you know, they're decimals. Those would all be times when you want to use the quadratic formula. And as a reminder, remember that the first number is A. That's the one that goes with X squared. The second number, including the sign in front of it, is B. And then the third number at the end is C. At no point in time are A, B, and C ever going to be a variable. A, B, and C are just numbers. So, without further ado, our final method. I'm going to draw one really long line with my square root symbol, and then off we go. Opposite of a negative would be a positive 2. I'm just putting the positive there for emphasis. Plus or minus the square root. This is a long square root of negative 2 squared minus 4 times a, which is 6, and c, which is 1, all over 2 times a, which is 6. So at this point, I immediately take the 2 plus or minus square root, and I leave that empty, figure out, okay, the denominator, 2 times 6, that's going to be 12. And then what I do right now is I take this whole thing, everything under the radical, and I figure out what number that is. So not the square root itself, just everything under it. So negative 2 in parentheses squared minus 4 times a, which was 6, and c, which was 1. And that gets me negative 25. And then from there, with that negative 20, we need to break that out into negative 1 times 4 times 5. We take the square root of negative 1, that's i, square root of 4, that's 2. Square root of 5 is just the square root of 5, and then we divide everything by 2. 